welcome to the fifth video, fifth lecture, fifth chapter of ecology. Today we are going to talk about my all-time favorite subject in biology, evolution. It's my favorite. And because we're going to be using lots of beetle examples today, I wore my beetle shirt even though a lot of these beetles have way too many legs. I think this is the only beetle on the whole shirt, this scarab beetle that has the right number of legs. But I still love this shirt anyway. So, we are going to talk about adaptation and evolution. Yeah! Let's get started! Okay, let's do it. Let's talk about evolution. Um, before you start this video, go to Schoology and get the learning goals for this chapter. And make sure you're filling those in as you watch this video. Um, this is just a little slide. I'm not going to talk about birds of paradise uh, in this video because we will talk all about them when we talk about sexual selection later. But this is just a little intro to one of my favorite adaptations. So let's uh, start off from the very beginning and define a few terms that we're going to be talking about um, before we get into the, the nitty gritty of the inter intersection between ecology and evolution. And not really even an intersection because the two are so integrally linked, they're kind of this, you can't have one without the other really. Um, so first let's define what natural selection is. Hopefully this should be a review from GenBio2 for you. Natural selection is the differential success of individuals within the population that results from their interaction with the environment. I'll repeat that again so you don't have to rewind. Natural selection is the differential success, which includes survival and reproduction, which we'll talk about in a second. It's the differential success of individuals within the population that results from their interaction with the environment. And so environment is a really key part of understanding evolution. So you can't have evolution without ecology. Uh, this slide shows one of my favorite adaptations. This is from your textbook. These are um, tenebrionid darkling beetles from the Namib desert. And in these environments, you might imagine, which we talked a little bit about when we talked about climate, it is very dry. And so water is very, very limited in these environments. And a lot of desert species, in, species, including these beetles, have evolved really awesome adaptations to um, collect water in the environment. Uh, what they do, and I've posted a little video about them on Schoology for you to watch from YouTube, is they, in the morning, uh, when the air is cooler and water is condensing in the air uh, and it's moist, they go to the tops of these sand dunes and they stick their little booties up in the air and because they have a waxy cuticle, the water is hydro, uh, wax is hydrophobic, and so the water clings to the outside. And because they're angling their bodies upwards, the water then drops down and goes to their mouth, and they drink it. And I was so excited last year when I went back to California to do research. I got to see a darkling beetle do this for the first time. It was adorable. I was at a botanic garden. Um, at like 9 in the morning and it was still kind of misty out. They have a little bit of what's called the marine layer there because they're pretty close to the coast. And this beetle has booty up in there trying to collect water from the atmosphere. So the water will collect on the hydrophobic wax on the outside of the cuticle in little beads and then because they're angled upwards it'll drop down, roll down to their mouth and then they'll drink it. So, natural section. Now let's talk about um, two of the conditions that natural selection is a product of. So first, to have natural selection occurring, you have to have variation within the population. So variation occurs among individuals with the population. And that you not only have to have variation, but that variation has to be inheritable. Um, we'll talk about some versions of um, traits that are not directly heritable, um, in ways that they can't be inherited to the next generation. So um, it has to be something that can be passed on to the next generation. That variation also needs to result in differences among the individuals in their survival and reproduction. So if this variation, um, you have a variation for, for instance, um, maybe in color, 
like you have in this example here that you heard all about in Gen Bio, the Bistum Betularia Industrial Melanism Complex with these um, moths, which I'll explain in a second. Let's say we have variation within a population uh, in black and white individuals of this moth species. Um, but they have the exact same survival rate. There's nothing affecting their fitness, which I'm going to define in the next slide. Then natural selection cannot occur if there's not a difference in fitness. So even though we might have a trait in the population that's heritable and is variable, it has to affect fitness. In this example, um, I'll go through just quickly. Hopefully you all remember it from Gen Bio. This is a study of moths in England. Um, pre and post industrial revolution. Um, pre industrial revolution, this spotted moth was really, really common um, because it allowed it to blend in. It was in a higher pr proportion in the population than the black color morph because it allowed it to blend in with lichen that was growing on the trees. This was pre industrial revolution. Post industrial revolution, trees lost that lichen and they also became covered in soot and then you have a switch in the fitness of the individuals because then these black morphs are able to blend in more with the bark, the white ones stand out more, and you see there was a, a change in the frequency in the population from mostly white morphs to mostly black morphs. Now let's talk about fitness because I, I just used that word. It's a really key, important part of natural selection. You can't just have variation. You can't just have it be heritable. It also has to be uh, uh, directly affect their fitness. Now, what is fitness? Fitness, for the purpose of this class, is the proportion uh, proportionate contribution an individual makes to future generations. I'll read that again. Fitness is the proportionate contribution an individual makes to future generations. Uh, and for the most part, that's measured via uh, reproduction. So when we're talking about um, fitness in bees, it's a little complicated um, because they're social. So that's why I'm using this example here. Fitness is a number of reproductive individuals that you are contributing to the next generation. Um, and I like to use this example in bees partly because it's more complicated um, than most systems and illustrates uh, the difficulty sometimes in measuring fitness when you're studying adaptation. So hopefully most of you know that at least bumblebees and honeybees are social. This is a, uh, an illustration of the life cycle of bumblebees. Um, if you were to, um, you wouldn't really be able to measure fitness in a colony by the number of workers that a queen produced because these workers um, for the most part besides sometimes producing uh, males they don't really contribute to the next generation and so in bees if you're going to measure fitness you need to measure how many queens that this queen was able to produce in the next generation so you'd measure from this one queen how many queens did she then produce? Now you might be able to use the number of workers as an indirect measure of fitness, but you're not really measuring how many offspring she's then contributing to the next generation unless you measure the one that's reproducing. Hopefully that example wasn't even more confusing for you to understand what fitness is. I like using it because uh, it shows that it's not, uh, an, it's not always an easy thing to measure. Um, this is the beautiful, beautiful bumblebee that I studied for my dissertation. Um, this is a queen meeting with a male. Now the, the combination of natural selection plus time over millions and millions of years is what results in evolution. Um, so we will talk about um, natural selection happening at the population level and then um, we will also talk about what happens over millions and millions of years and results in the evolution of new species. So when we're talking about natural selection, more specifically, we're talking about um, changes in uh, genotype frequencies um, and phenotype frequencies, usually within a single species. But when we talk about um, evolution on a, a larger scale, we'll talk, we're talking about um, the evolution of new species over time. Now let's talk a little bit about what adaptation is. So adaptation is any heritable behavioral, morphological, 
or physiological trait of an organism that has evolved over a period of time by the process of natural selection such that it maintains or increases the fitness of an organism, and this is the really important part of the definition, under a given set of environmental conditions. In the um, uh, Biston Bachelaria example with industrial melanization is a perfect example of how if that environment changes, so can their fitness and how natural selection acts on those organisms. So I'll read the definition of adaptation again for you. Adaptation is any heritable, behavioral, morphological, or physiological trait of an organism that has evolved over a period of time by the process of natural selection such that it maintains or increases the fitness of an organism under a given set of environmental conditions. And I've included some of my favorite adaptations here. This one I shot a video of just yesterday. This is Joe Jr. Jr., our um, spice bush swallowtail that we found in lab. Um, this is a really amazing adaptation um, where these caterpillars mimic snakes to ward off predators. Um, so both of these are actually two different forms of mimicry, which we'll talk about later on. Um, this is a lichen uh, grasshopper that um, has all these projections in this mottled coloring to blend in with lichen in the environment so predators can't see it. This is an example of trying to fool a predator by thinking you're another predator. So just some really cool examples of adaptations. And what we'll do um, in our in-person sessions is I will give you um, a few examples of an adaptation and then you'll have to come up with a, uh, a hypothesis for the uh, environmental scenario that created that adaptation over time. And we'll do some of those exercises because you'll have to do that on the exam. So let's talk a little bit about how um, this variation is inherited um, through generations. Hopefully you all remember Gregor Mendel, especially if you're in Brother Albert's Gen Bio class because he loves Gregor Mendel. Um, this is an illustration by one of my favorite artists, Charlie Harper, of Gregor Mendel from a, a textbook he illustrated. Um, we call Gregor Mendel the father of modern genetics um, because he was really using these experiments with pea plants that you learn all about in Gen Bio, um, figured out the, the basic rules for inheritance from generation to generation. Genes are really the underlying unit um, that on which evolution occurs. Um, hopefully, again, this is all review as well. Um, the genotype that you have uh, in the genome is what then creates the phenotype that is expressed physically. And uh, a phenotype can be a behavior. It can be, um, like I said, it can be a physiological thing. It can be um, a gene expression pattern. It can be uh, having horns, having no horns. There's lots of different examples I can give of phenotypes, but they are very, very broad because genes um, regulate lots of different things in the animal. They regulate everything. So um, just review these terms in your textbook. Remember, hopefully you remember what um, some of these mean because these are the units on which natural selection is going to act upon. Um, hopefully you remember that an allele is a variant of a gene. Um, if you are homozygous, you have in an organism that is diploid, you have uh, two copies of the same allelic variant, like this one here. This one's homozygous. Heterozygous means you have two different alleles for one gene in a diploid individual. So this one's heterozygous. Um, I'm not going to read through all these definitions. Y'all can review them on your own. Um, but one thing uh, that I want to cover again, um, because it, I think we cover it very simplistically in Gen Bio, is the difference between qualitative and quantitative traits. So um, a qualitative trait is a phenotypic characteristic that falls into a, a limited number of discrete categories. Um, and usually it's because there are only 
uh, one or maybe two genes involved with the expression of that trait. Um, so these two traits that you see here, yellow or green peas, red or pink flowers, even though this one is um, uh, incomplete dominance and this one is a um, dominant recessive system, um, both of these are qualitative traits because you're either red, you're either white or you're pink or you're either yellow or you're either green. And that's because there's very few genes. Uh, in this case, there's only a single gene that is responsible for this phenotype. Now, a quantitative trait, on the other hand, is a phenotypic characteristic that has a continuous distribution. Height is the classic example of a quantitative trait. And that's because uh, there are many, many genes responsible for um, creating this phenotype. And because there are many, many genes, there are lots of possible combinations of alleles that you can have at all those different genes that are involved. And that's why you get a continuous distribution um, when you measure each of and each individual for this trait. So height is a classic example of a quantitative trait. Now let's talk a little bit more about phenotypes um, in a more complicated scenario. So, um, so far, and maybe you might have learned about this in GenBio, I can't remember right now, even though I know I teach the class. Um, you know about the genotype to phenotype um, relationship. Sometimes phenotypes can be plastic in that they can change depending on the environmental situation. And so phenotypic plasticity is the ability to change form under different environmental conditions. I'll say that one more time. Phenotypic plasticity is the ability to change form under different environmental conditions. Uh, and there, these are two examples from your textbook, which of course I love because they're insects. So these two here, these are lubber grasshoppers. Um, the top lubber grasshopper was reared at 35 degrees Celsius. This bottom one was reared at 25 degrees Celsius. And so it, the environmental temperature in which these grasshoppers are raised in affects the expression of the genes that encode the color pattern phenotypes on this grasshopper. So um, in insects, melanin is largely responsible for colors that you see. And so um, I don't know if this is exactly true. I'm kind of making this up on the spot, but it's probably pretty close to true for these grasshoppers is that uh, when you rear grasshoppers at 35 degrees Celsius, something happens to their color genes uh, that increases their expression of mel or decreases their expression of melanin, and so you get a lighter color form. But then, if you uh, rear them at a lower temperature, that lower temperature um, increases the expression of their melanin, and then they create more black in their exoskeleton. Very, it's a very general summary of probably the gene regulation that's going on to create this. But yeah. This is also a, a color change that's induced by temperature. Um, these are harlequin bugs. The black one is reared at 22 degrees Celsius. The yellow one is reared at 30 degrees Celsius. And so um, color is a phenotypically plastic trait in harlequin bugs and in grasshoppers. And so it's a phenotype that can change its form under different environmental conditions. Um, I want to make sure you understand the difference between developmental plasticity and acclimation. Sometimes these things are, can be confused. So in developmental plasticity, this is a change that's occurring during development. These are adult grasshoppers. These are adult harlequin bugs. Um, they cannot change their color once they've reached their adult stage. And that is an example of developmental plasticity. So. Developmental plasticity involves an environmental change or a change in environmental condition during development so that once they reach adulthood, they can't change. Um, nutrition, uh, it plays a really big role in um, developmentally plastic traits. So um, a lot of organisms, if they don't receive a lot of nutrition early on in development, they'll end up being smaller, um, sometimes less developed, 
but that they can't go back. They can't then all of a sudden eat food as adults and then, well, they can get a lot of fat probably as adults, but they can't, um, for instance, grow taller or, um, yeah, just an example of developmental plasticity. So this is a trait. Um, these are differences in phenotypic traits for a given phenotype. So in these cases, color pattern under different environmental conditions that reflect differences in the allocation of biomass to different tissues during growth and development of these individual organisms. So they can't change once they've reached, reached adulthood for developmental plasticity. Acclimation, on the other hand, an organism can change its single individual phenotype back and forth depending on the environment. So developmental plasticity inside a single organism, it makes a change in response to the environment, but it can't go back. Acclimation, the organism changes in response to the environment back and forth. Um, two really great examples. You see a lot of developmental plasticity and color pattern um, in Arctic animals. This is an Arctic hare. This is an Arctic fox. Um, in the winter, their fur turns white so that they can blend in and hide from predators or hide from prey. <laughs> and then in the summer, they get um, a coat color change that presumably might help them increase their temperature. Um, they don't need to blend. Well, the environment's not white anymore because there's no snow. And so they don't need to blend in with a white environment anymore. So this is acclimation, a change in color pattern. And then this is a really awesome cuttlefish that is changing acclimating in real time to change and match the substrate to blend in. So acclimation, reversible, developmental plasticity, a change that's not reversible. Um, now let's talk a little bit about genetic variation that um, encodes for um, some of these phenotypes that are act acted upon by natural selection. Um, again, hopefully this is still review from GenBio, um, but let's go over these terms quickly again. This map here that I have is a map of um, a population genetic study that I did in grad school. And here are some of the phenotypes that coincide with these genotypes. Okay, so genetic differentiation is when genetic variation occurs among sub subpopulations of the same species. So um, what you see here is all genetic variation that is occurring um, within subpopulations of the same species. Gene pool is the sum of all the genes of all the individuals in the population. Um, so that's not entirely represented by this graph, um, but that would be all the genes of all the individuals within a population is the gene pool that you are, that natural selection is acting upon. Allele frequency is the proportion of a given allele among all the alleles present at that locus in the population. So, um, that's not really displayed in this graph either, um, but that's what the allele frequency is. Now what's displayed in this graph is not only genetic differentiation, but also genotype frequency. So genotype frequency is the proportion of various genotypes. So um, big A, little a, big A, big A, little a, little a, the frequency of those genotypes, the combination of alleles in a population. So, um, each of these different colors represents um, a distinct genotype that's present within this population at the set of loci that I looked at, which are loci or different genes. Um, and so each of these different colors represents a different genotype and these pies represent the genotype frequencies for a given population. So we've covered the things that you need for natural selection to happen. The, now let's talk a little bit more about um, the mechanism and how it happens. Um, so when we're thinking about natural selection, we're thinking about um, and how it happens. We have the target of selection and the selective agent. So the target of selection is going to be the phenotypic trait that selection acts directly upon. So we've talked about how you make that phenotype and what conditions that phenotype needs to meet 
to be able to be acted upon by natural selection. Um, but the only thing that natural selection is going to act upon, it's not acting directly on the genotype, it's acting on what that genotype creates in terms of phenotype. So in this case, um, the target of selection would be color pattern of the moth. So that's the phenotypic trait that the selection is acting directly upon. Now, that's the target of selection. To have natural selection, you also have to have something that is selecting it. So that would be the selective agent. And so the selective agent is the environmental cause of fitness differences among or organisms with different phenotypes. So I'm going to say that again. And while I say it, think about what the selective agent would be in this example. So the selective agent is the environmental cause of fitness differences among organisms with different phenotypes. So in this example, what would be the selective agent? If color pattern of moth is the target of selection, what is the environmental cause that's making differences in fitness among these different phenotypes? Oh, did I hear you say it? Did you say burbs? You're right, it's birds that are eating the moths. So birds in this example are the selective agent. If they're flying around looking for some tasty moth treats and they land in this tree pre-industrial revolution, they're gonna eat that guy because he stands out, right? Post-industrial revolution, once there's no more lichen on the trees and they're darker, you can't see this one as well anymore, and the birds are gonna eat these tasty little snacky treats, sneaky little snacks. So, in this example, the selective agent is the bird that is creating a fitness difference in these organisms. And we're gonna go through a few examples um, when we meet together in person out at Winnie Palmer too, um, because you will be asked to do this kind of thing on the exam. Um, let's talk about different types of selection. Um, hopefully this is an example you all know because it's very, very well studied. It's a really great example of natural selection occurring in real time and it's covered in gem bio. Um, hopefully you have all at this point have heard about Darwin's finches. Um, if you go to Schoology, I'd like you to watch, um, and you should watch it because it will be on the test and help you understand natural selection. There's a great video from HHMI that's got, um, Sean Carroll interviewing Peter and Rosemary Grant, who were this, um, this couple, the, these two evolutionary biologists that were married that studied the Galapagos finches for decades, um, and really, um, shed a lot of light on the mechanisms and the ways in which evolution occurs in natural environments. Um, so first we're, we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about finches in class and the mechanism of how um, evolution has shaped Darwin's finches. We'll talk about that in person, but let's talk about it here as an example of directional selection. So we're going to talk about three different types of selection. Um, and hopefully this is also a review from Gen Bio. So directional selection is when the mean value of a trait is shifted towards one extreme over the other. Um, and so Darwin's finches, you see a shifting in beak size based on um, seed availability in the environment um, due to a drought. <laughs> um, getting larger over time in this single environment. This is over the course of um, just a couple of years. And you can see evolution happen rapidly like this when um, there is very, very strong selection in the environment. Evolution can happen, um, it, it happens over millions of years at, on much slower scales, but it can also happen um, very quickly if the agent of selection um, is creating really, really large differences in fitness based on phenotype in the environment. So in this example, um, beak depth is the target of selection. And what would be the selective agent? I'll let you think about it. Oh, what's that? Did I hear you say seed size? Well, you would be correct. The selective agent 
would be seed size and seed availability in the environment. So we'll talk more about this in person during class. You can also have stabilizing selection and stabilizing selection is when you have um, selection favoring the median, the median mean phenotype and so you have higher fitness for the mean phenotype over um, phenotypes that are at the extreme of a distribution of phenotypes. Um, human birth weight is the one that's used in almost all biology classes. Um, there's really strong selective advantage um, to being in the mean birth weight. And so you get a, um, a, you start to see a steepness in the curve for that phenotype. So you can imagine, um, at least in humans, for birth weight, if you're very, very small, there's a very, very um, low survival rate and a decrease in fitness. It, and then on the other end of the spectrum, if you're very, very large, that creates other birth complications. And so there's also a decrease in fitness at this end. So you have the highest fitness at the mean. That's stabilizing selection. You can also have disruptive selection where you have um, two, uh, well, usually you have two different selective agents in the environment that are creating um, a disruption in the phenotype um, proportions in the environment. So um, something is selecting for phenotypes here and here in the distribution. There's lower fitness for the mean, and so you start to see a bimodal distribution in phenotypes. And of course, the classic example for this would be um, three, uh, three spine sticklebacks. They are really well studied in evolutionary biology. Um, this here is a picture of uh, sticklebacks from uh, Paxton Lake, where they've been studied in Canada. Um, this upper fish, this is the limnetic form. This bottom one, this is the benthic form. And what you can see is that both of these occur in the same lakes. Benthic means they live at the bottom. Limnetic, they live towards the top. Um, and they have really different external morphology and internal morphology in terms of their gill rakers, which help them catch food. In the limnetic form, they're longer and thinner. In the benthic form, they're shorter and stubbier. And so, um, if you think about this morphology and how it affects their ability to feed, you might um, hypothesize that the selective agent in the environment would be what they're eating. And you would be right. Uh, at the bottom of the lake, you have different um, zooplankton communities living there than you have at the top of the lake. And that is based on some of the things we talked about in previous lectures, like light availability and temperature. It's going to shape the zooplankton communities. Those zooplankton communities are then going to act as a selective agent on the fish populations that feed in them. So these benthic ones, these gill rakers are short and stubby and they help them eat larger things like amphipods um, that live in more benthic environments. In the limnetic form, they're eating smaller things that live um, near the top of the lake like artemedia, brine shrimp types of um, zooplankton that are in the environment. Um, and because of this difference in uh, food availability in the environment, it's shaped the morphology of these fish over time in the same environment and resulted in disruptive selection. Now there are um, several different ways that uh, other than natural selection that can alter patterns of genetic variations within a population. Now, I know everyone looks at this equation and is like, oh, no, not Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium again. But if you're in my gen bio class and my evolution class, you hear this little mini rant from me all the time, is that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium may be a little boring to learn about, but it's really important because Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium functions as the null hypothesis for all the other cool stuff that happens. Um, this is the, the operating null hypothesis for helping us understand when really cool evolutionary events are happening in nature. And so 
I know it can be kind of dry and boring, but it is really, really freaking important. So we're going to cover it again. Here are the five assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, you should remember that over time, the allele frequencies and the genotype frequencies won't change and they should all sum to one. So under those assumptions, there's no selection occurring. So there's no difference in fitness among the individuals in the population. There's no mutation occurring. There's no migration in and out of the population. The population is large and they mate randomly. Now, it is the violations of these assumptions when you get the really cool stuff happening. So that's why I have this here. So let's go back to some stuff I've done. Um, so when I published the paper um, looking at these species, I had to test for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It's really important to test for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium when you're doing population genetic studies. Um, and what we found is that while a lot of these populations up here did indeed um, fit the null hypothesis of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, so all these pop most of these populations up here were in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. These populations down here, when we tested them for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, were not. And we used this equation to test that. This is real life Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in action, y'all. So these populations down here were not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so that was, that was surprising. It was like, what's going on here? Why are these not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? And the reason was that what I thought was a single gene pool actually turned out to be two. These, this green and this orange uh, lineage are two very, very gen different genetic lineages. And so the thing that was violating Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium here is that I was looking at more than one, um, more than one species, which I didn't know at the time. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is very useful in real world. Um, so when you violate Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that's when you get the good stuff. So um, mutations are one way that you can get evolution evolution can occur, um, genetic drift, which um, is the random assortment. We'll cover this a little more in depth in later lectures, but it's the, um, it's very, it's much more likely to occur in small populations than in large populations, and it has to do with changes in allele frequencies over time just due to random chance. Um, genetic drift can, if the population is small, actually be um, a very important agent of change in small populations. Um, gene flow via migration can also result in natural selection, changes in natural selection and changes to populations over time and violations of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Assortative mating, which um, if we, we talk about this in my evolution class, we can talk about it in ecology if y'all want to during our literature discussions. Assortative mating um, can also lead to um, uh, natural selection. So positive assortative mating would be when you have an increase in homozygotes. It's going to change the genotype uh, frequencies in the population and also increase the chances of inbreeding. Negative assortative mating is an increase in heterozygote. So this is um, mating amongst individuals that are less genetically similar. This is mating amongst individuals that are more genetically similar. Um, and then also inbreeding, um, which again, also is really common in um, small populations, just like genetic drift. Um, inbreeding depression can also lead to changes in populations um, over time. But it's also, it's really important to note that um, only natural selection is going to lead to adaptation. So all of these things can lead to changes in populations over time, but it's only natural selection that's going to lead to adaptations. So um, that's a really, really um, important point to make because um, only if 
something in the environment is causing a difference in fitness, maybe due to these things, only then will that then lead to adaptation. Um, so let's talk about some cool um, phenomenons that you can have, phenomena that you can have in nature um, based on genetic differentiation. One example is a cline. So a cline is a measurable gradual change over a geographic region in the average of some phenotypic character. So size or coloration. In this example, it's size. Um, I'll read that definition again for you. Klein is a measurable gradual change over a geographic region in the average of some phenotypic characters, such as size or coloration. Um, this is a really great example that I got to see in real life in California in um, yarrow. I actually just planted some in my yard yesterday. Um, this is um, uh, native to North America. They're I think a few different species. I might be wrong about that. But yarrow is also native to the Sierra Nevada range where I did my postdoctoral research. Um, and I talked about this range when we were talking about rain shadows because you can get a rain shadow on this side. Um, so this side of the Sierra Nevada is closer to the coast. It gets a little more rainfall. Um, this side is mostly desert where you get that rain shadow. And that those differences in environment are also going to shape the plants that grow there. Um, at these lower elevations, Groveland is um, this town right outside you enter Yosemite National Park. Um, the Yarrow populations there are much taller in height, but as you move up the mountains, you have um, shorter summer and spring seasons because they're very high in elevation. You have much more time under which um, they're buried in snow. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been to Yosemite National Park, but Tuolumne Meadows is also within the park. This area is still completely buried in snow until about the end of July into August. Um, and then it's buried in snow again, usually by October at the latest. And so the seasons, the summer seasons, are very short for flowering plants up there. And because of that, they don't have a lot of time to grow, and so they're, they're stunted in height. Um, and this is... Um, not phenotypic plasticity, this is actual um, genotypic differences that you can see in these populations, um, which makes it a climb. Um, another example of, um, a really cool example of uh, natural selection in the wild is an ecotype. So ecotypes are populations that are adapted to um, unique local environmental conditions. So when we talk about clines and ecotypes, we are talking about um, natural selection that has happened within a single species. Um, so even though there are genetic differences between these um, smaller um, yarrow at the tops of these mountains and these bigger ones, they're still considered a single species, um, even though there are fixed genetic differences between them. You can also have that in an ecotype. So these are um, the same species of field mice. Hopi Hoekstra is a, a really famous evolutionary biologist who's done some really awesome evolutionary research on um, these mice in um, mainland and beach environments. So if you're looking at this mouse species in beach environments, this is the color pattern that you see. If you're looking at the mouse inland, the same species, this is the color pattern that you see predominantly. So these are, um, you don't see just this, but you see predominantly this phenotype and then predominantly this phenotype mainland. And so um, Hoki, Hopi Hoekstra's lab decided to test the hypothesis of the, that um, these changes in phenotype um, are due to um, interactions with predators in the environment and they allow them to blend into the environment more. Um, so they made these models of mice and sometimes put dead mice out into the environment and looked at predator attacks. So I think I talked a little bit about how you can use clay models of animals and measure um, individual bites on them by birds and other things um, to look at a um, number of prey attacks. So they put these models and or dead animals out in the environment. And then they looked and saw how many times a predator tried to attack it. And... What they found is that um, these white models 
were much less likely to be attacked by predators in the beach environments. Um, and these darker models were much less likely to be attacked in the mainland environments. These were all bitten up um, or taken away when they were placed in beach environments. And then these white ones, obviously not nearly as cryptic, um, m much heavier predator attacks in this environment. So this is an example of an ecotype. Um, you can also have geographic isolates, um, and these can be shaped by natural selection. Um, sometimes they can be shaped through other processes. Um, geographic isolates um, are just um, geographically distinct subpopulations within a single species. So um, I found geographic isolates when I was doing my PhD research. Um, each of these different colors represents um, a unique genotype uh, in this, in these bumblebee, this bumblebee species. And what I found is that, um, there seem to be unique genetic lineages that correspond to the different mountain ranges that you have in Mexico. Um, so this is the Sierra Madre Occidental, Sierra Madre Oriental range. This is the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt. And then this is the Sierra Madre del Sur. They all have different um, geologic histories and they have, um, they're also um, have some geographic barriers, so they're not contiguous. They don't always connect with each other. And you can see that there seems to be a genetic lineage that's unique to each of these different kinds of mountain ranges in Mexico. But you can also see that in this area where the Sierra Madre del Sur connects with the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt and the Sierra Madre Occidental, you get a lot more gene flow and a lot more mixing there because they connect to each other. So this is an example of a geographic isolate. And sometimes these geographic isolates are designated as subspecies, um, but it depends on the group that you're talking about. Um, some species are more common generally in people who study mam mammals. You don't see subspecies designation so much in um, insects except for probably honeybees. Um, but every um, adaptation comes with a, a trade-off and there are constraints on that adaptation. Um, there's only so much energy in the environment um, and there are going to be metabolic limits on the kinds of adaptations that organisms are able to form in response to natural selection. Um, and this is one of my favorite examples of talking about the trade-offs and constraints involved in adaptations um, because I think it makes it really, really clear that um, energy is limited and there's only so much uh, that a single organism uh, is capable of in terms of adaptation. So this was a study that was done um, by Arne Mochek in his lab at uh, Indiana University looking at the trade-offs between primary and section, secondary sexual characters in um, these beetles. Um, th these are both males. Um, this is a male with smaller horns. This is a male with larger horns. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, nutrition. Body size is very heavily regulated in these beetles um, based on nutrition. And uh, so the less nutrition they get during larval development, the smaller their horns will be. That's an example of developmental plasticity. Um, but there's a, a nutritional trade-off during development um, for making these horns. So what they found is that um, these beetles that invest a lot of energy in forming horns um, tend to have smaller testes size. And these ones that invest less energy into horn development have larger testes. Um, and so there's a trade-off. So maybe they are able to um, fight other males um, with these horns better, but maybe they have lower reproductive capacity when they actually do get to, fe to mate with a female because they have lower, smaller testes. These guys, maybe they can't perform as well in um, courtship battles because they have smaller horns, but when they do get the chance to reproduce, uh, they have higher success rates because they have larger testes. So um, this is a really great illustration of uh, the trade-offs involved in some of these um, um, adaptations involved in reproduction. And that's it for this lecture. 
This one's a little longer than the ones that we've had so far, mostly because I just love talking about this stuff. Um, tune in next time for Chapter 6. Bye-bye!